this quote is from Nobel Prize winner Joseph Stiglitz, and what it means essentially is that it's going to cost less to decarbonise our society than to bear the economic damages from the temperature increases, the extreme weather and so on, from extra emissions. To not act on climate change is to suppress economic growth and development from what it could be. In a nutshell, managing climate change is managing the economy. This is the premise. Uh, that's not the premise. Arrow's not working. Thing O. Now it's working. This is the premise. I'd like to discuss three parts of this premise. Um, actually be good, well, how good? What is correctly waging it according to economics? And the question mark. This will all look very simple. There are many technicalities, caveats, considerations and problems that need solutions. These problems and solutions are the nature of our research. I'll only flash up a few slides very quickly that look techy, etc without the detail. Um, okay, how good? Greenhouse gas emissions, nitrogen emissions to air and surface waters, water withdrawals, land conversion, excess salt, excess sugar, lack of fibre, and so on. These are the byproducts of food production and food consumption that create damages for present and future economies. The many Many reports over the last decade about the food system have estimated the magnitudes of these byproducts, their pathways to impacts such as poor health, climate change, biodiversity loss. I'm going to assume that you're all conversant and knowledgeable in those areas. There has been less work bringing this all together to understand the economic damage and the economic opportunity. Um, this graphic is from uh, 2019 Food and Land Use Coalition, uh, that's FOLU report. The numbers are in trillions in the year indicated. It estimates the reduction in damages in a better food system in 2050. If you look at the difference between the middle column, that says 2050 current trends or uh, business as usual. And on the right is the better food system in 2050. I advised the coalition on the report. I was one of many, many advisors, so I know that food loss and waste and nitrogen use efficiency, which is, uh, they all look a bit orange there, but it's one of the orange bars, are negative abatement costs. They're not damage costs. Treatment costs for poor health were included, but they actually reflect only partially in damages to overall income equivalent social welfare, so they are also not damage cost to society overall. So we exclude some of, our, some of those. Um, this graphic is one of a few, only a few global estimates and there are no published global estimates where the damages are assessed at country level. So let's say the better food system removes six trillion in damages it's per annum in 2050, not the 10.6 listed here. So let's put that in perspective. Six trillion, what does that mean? Six trillion in 2050 GDP purchasing power parity terms, it's likely to be about three to four percent of global GDP in 2050. The IMF calculated that the global financial crisis cost OECD countries 3.5 percent of their GDP in 2014 meaning that their economies should have been 3.5% larger in that year without the crisis. So in context, removing the damages from the food system could potentially boost the global economy to the same degree as removing the impact of the global financial crisis. The financial crisis was a shock. Damages from the food system are a continual stress. So you would retain that economic stimulus for longer. And if you think back to the financial crisis and you saw in the first talk, there was a blip. Before the blip from the pandemic, there was another blip where you saw carbon emissions go down because carbon emissions are tied to economic output. That was the global financial crisis. If you think back and remember, that's a lot of change in people's lives. You're talking about affecting billions of people. The byproducts of the food system, the greenhouse gas emissions, the nitrogen emissions and so on, become economic quantities 
in their own right at this scale. They, beca they become something we want to track, that we want to keep um, managing, and we want to reduce the supply of these impact quantities because of their effects on society and on social welfare. So that's one estimate of the damages. Uh, let me just give you a quick aside. Um, I'll just throw up a few slides of our own work under the Food System Economic Co Commission, which will report in 2023. This work on damages is also continuing under an EU Horizon project, food costs from 2022 to 2026. Um, so for FSEC, that's the Food System Economic Commission, we developed an open source damage costing model. The cost data sets are free to download. It covers 160 countries. Um, it has greenhouse gases, nitrogen emissions, dietary intake, blue water withdrawal, ecosystem service losses from land use conversion, and it models uncertainty in quite a lot of detail. Um, for spatial detail, you can look at countries. So those are the costs of nitrogen. If you look at that number, one trillion. If you look at nitrogen, it has an enormous amount of uncertainty. That's because we do not know how nitrogen in the environment is affecting natural capital and how the net loss of natural capital is affecting our economy. It's a massive amount of uncertainty. But don't try and hide that uncertainty, just put it in and then think about the risk. So for spatial detail, for nitrogen in particular, you can go down to the country level, you can see your costs, and all sorts of fancy things can be done by our particular code. You can understand the spatial distribution of the damages, you can look at distributions of HDI, you look at, can look at inequity in the cost bearing, where in a supply chain, if you're a large company, or if you're the EU and you're exporting your damages around the world, who is bearing the costs of your um, food consumption? So one finding to note, like I said, the comparison of greenhouse gas costs and nitrogen damage costs. Um, and the, the other aspect is that averting climate change is only one third of the story of averting the damages of the current food system. They're not the same. And for the private sector, I would take note because the nitrogen in your supply chain is going to come under the same scrutiny as this decade continues as your greenhouse gases in your supply chain. Um, final one, I'd like to mention just that it includes <coughs> consumption related, just because there's so many nutritionists in the room, etc., people looking at public health. It does include consumption related costs as well as environmental costs. We have a full implementation in Python of the global burden of disease models, which many of you would know for dietary risks. End aside. Um, now, going back to those costs, the damage costs, it would be sublime if we could reduce supply of these impact quantities and recover the damages they cause at no cost to us. That millions of farmer, farmers in China would use the right amount of fertilizer and lower their input costs. That billions would find equal value in a diet lower in high um, greenhouse gas and reactive nitrogen intensity animal products, probably also lowering their costs of food purchasing. That hundreds of millions would buy the right amount of food in their weekly shop, again with considerable savings to themselves. These all seem like Pareto efficiencies, which is an economic term to say win-wins. Um, then why aren't they happening? Why is this not happening despite the cost-saving incentives? So it is going to cost to transform the food system. The Folio report estimated how much under this term investment that was required to achieve their better food system. These are not the full cost to transform to that better food system. And working out the cost of transformation is one of the unsolved problems in the field that we have invented in the last few years called food system economics. This is where we get into the correctly waged part. Uh, maybe we'll get into some examples of those points later, but I'm not going to go into them. Why am I using the term abatement cost? Why do I not just say 
the cost to transform the food system so we can get all of those damages back. The term abatement cost has an implied priority to your abatement measures. So part of the correct way to wage transformation, according to economists, is cost effectiveness in reaching a reduction target in those impact quantities. Give yourself targets, have a cost effective way to reach them. Developing such cost curves, they've been done for the energy system, developing such cost curves for the food system has many more difficulties than for the energy system. Um, we have no idea at the moment where to place technological measures against behavioural measures. Where do you place the red seaweed, Asparagopsis taxiformis, that only grows off South Australia, and I know because I am from South Australia, that it's going to be the technological salvation of intense beef and dairy production. You've all heard about the red seaweed that reduces the um, methane emissions that are burped out on cows by 90%, etc. Where do you place this technolo technological wonder against dietary change that has the same amount of abatement to it? The IPCC doesn't know the cost to reduce food waste and dietary change, even for abatement of emissions. The grey here says we don't know. So going back to Stiglitz's quote, Stiglitz is not saying that the costs of transition to a low emission economy are small, are manageable, um, are orderly, that everybody's going to win under this transition. It says that the huge costs of doing nothing when stacked up are greater than the huge costs of transformation. The economic gain in food system transformation is the reduction as well of those huge damages minus the potentially huge abatement costs. So how good? It could be very good. Averting an unnecessarily financial crisis each year changes millions, if not billions, of people's lives. We don't know the costs of correctly waging it. Uh, it's a fundamental research question, and, and that's the question mark. So uh, that's the basic take home. Now, I was also asked by the organisers to comment on what uh, industry and regulators could do. I've got to admit I struggled here because it's not what to say, but there is too much to say. Uh, this is a session all by itself. Um, I could say some conventional stuff and there are some, uh, ooh, there are some later slides, if you see the slide deck, about some conventional stuff to, stuff to do. Um, instead, I thought it might be fun. Um, maybe you tell me what you would do and I'm going to give you your budget. So let's look at a cost of transformation in a different way. What is the break-even cost of transformation? Convert a li let's just say it's a linear increase in damages averted up to that six trillion value value in 2050. So converting into present values, that's a discount rate of 3.5%. The red is an overestimate of the value investment cost every year up to 2050. What is the number X here in present dollars Let's say over the next 10 years, you're going, to, you're going to put X dollars into food system transformation such that the area under the zero, under the graph, is equal to the area over the graph. That's the break-even cost. Five, five trillion per year at a discount rate of 3.5%. That's your budget for transformation for the next 10 years to divert the global market to an equilibrium realising this better food system and to break even. Food system transformation would be the fifth largest economy in the world. Five trillion is the same size as the German economy. That is the scale of the economic transition. You think of all of the economic activity in Germany. That is the scale of the economic transition required to go from the current food system to this better one. A uh, five trillion does seem pretty huge, but just think for a minute. We use about three billion hectares of land for food production. A global vegan diet with full nutrient and energy sufficiency would require one billion hectares. You've all seen the Eat Lancet diet, etc. Think of all the capital, the sunk costs, the goods and services supporting the use of two billion hectares of land. 
There are tens of trillions of dollars of sunk capital costs on that land. To wipe the value from the capital investment on 2 billion hectares would collapse the financial system. You can offer an income to those landholders to pay off that sunk capital, to write it off. 10 tonnes of sequestration per hectare of carbon at a carbon price, a very generous price for carbon, not carbon dioxide, carbon, um, of 100 to 250 per tonne is 1000 to $2,500 per hectare. $2,500 per hectare times 2 billion hectares, there's your $5 trillion. So you can afford income, but can you afford the transition costs or the asset losses for ancillary services? You can easily eat up your budget, so five trillion might seem like you're the richest person on earth, um, but you have to budget and you have to manage. With trillions at stake, you would think pricing impacts of the food system into the market is going to be a battleground of vested interests. But now, that's the interesting thing. With trillions, you can literally buy out those interests. Um, there was a speaker yesterday, Janet, was talking about how much the US spends on advertising. Uh, I looked last night, the University of Connecticut, Rudd Center estimates that food, beverage and re restaurant companies spend 11 billion per year on advertising in the United States, promoting fast food, sugary drinks, candy, un unhealthy snacks, that's the unhealthy spend. Um, Amazon bought Whole Foods. Nestle sold its entire US candy food business. Nestle sold its entire US ice cream business. And it bought Sweet Earth, which was a Whole Foods, essentially a Whole Foods plant-based company. It has bought Freshly, another healthy food de deliveries in competition with Amazon. It has invested heavily in plant-based brands. So potentially, when I say $11 billion of advertising, I just suggested to a smart company that the US government pay $11 billion worth of free advertising for them. Where are the vested interests if you can get them onto the track that you want? This is not costing livelihoods. This is a subsidy. And it should act alongside other transition support to transfer livelihoods and skills from the losers to the winners. In this transition, Overall, society is gaining this much, but there are winners and losers. Now, the advertisers still have their money. The smart guys are free advertising. So who's left to care when you now start regulating on harmful ads? Once you get the vested interest out the room, then you can come in and put something that will keep them out for the next 10 to 15 years. Then the economy has adapted around it and will not come back. Companies move when five trillion of writing is on the wall. The CEO of Nestle, Unilever and Olam have all asked for a global carbon tax. It's not moving. This isn't save the planet stuff. They believe that they will be disproportionate winners in the relative cost in their supply chain and the disbursement of revenue. They are looking for governments to reward the steps they have already made. And they are looking to make step too far and you'll end up like the known CEO. But casualties occur in a war of winners and losers. And there is a huge economic prize waiting for the winners. The next CEO willing to step into the bridge can step further. And don't cry for them because long-term investors and MBA schools will be singing songs of their exploits in 20 years' time. No saving technology is going to enable intense meat production with further intense meat production with planetary boundaries. There was a, a talker yesterday discussing um, the French farmers were worried. The French farmers discussed yesterday are at the top of their productivity curve to comfort them that sustainable production will save their bacon is exactly the opposite of what a policy maker should do with their eye on maximising social value. You must pick winners and losers through the cap. You must pick winners and losers 
through the mechanisms that you have. And some of these farmers should be losers. They cannot all survive. We are speculating very clear damages on miracles of production. By out the current generation of the... Of I don't know how to choose. I'm not the policy maker, but... By out the current generation of some of these farmers, say, look, I've got to be honest with you. You should be worried, but I can pay you to farm carbon for a generation. It will see you out to your retirement. It will lock the land use long enough for the economy to adapt around it. It will provide an opportunity for your children to transition their livelihoods into this new economy. People will adapt to the new economic normal better than the new environmental normal. We have no idea what it's going to be like to live in a 3.5 degree world. We are underestimating it. They will adapt better to the new economic normal. We must, and, and on me, we must nullify the belief that meat is either good or bad. That's just a tactic. It's a futile debate that is easily solved by understanding the most fundamental of economic concepts, marginal utility. The value of one kilogram more of meat depends on the production volume and the intake of, of it and other foodstuffs. It is neither good or bad outside of that context. I mean, have we not learned from climate change how to get around the belief tactic? When we must dispel this other religion that the market will discover optimal social value. That is predicated on a mathematical theorem that assumes perfect markets. And we have a hole in our market the size of Germany. Governments are the custodians of societal value. When markets are not perfect, societal value will diverge from financial value discovered through exchanges on those markets. There are no Pareto, pathway, Pareto pathways to bring the two back together. There are no win-win ways to bring the two back together. The custodians must set the rules of a new equilibrium. Not everyone in the economy is going to win. The winners are going to win more than they had before. That is the incentive for the winners at the expense of the losers. And wedging the winners and losers is one accelerator of transformation that has worked in the past and would work again. Uh, there is a lot more to say, especially on the care that needs to be taken with second best taxation, such as meat taxes. Um, I actually have a bit of time, so I'll mention that one. Um, second best ta taxation means you're not actually taxing directly those impact quantities. So then you can have a suboptimal policy and a suboptimal result. If you tax meat in the EU, EU, let's say you also had a carbon tax in the EU, so the farmer, the demand is reduced for the farmer in the EU and their input price is going up, the price of fertiliser is going up, it's got the carbon tax on it, so they're squeezed. So where is the EU farmer going to go? They're going to move out, some of them are going to move out of the market. Has EU demand dropped for meat? Not necessarily, unless you've made a policy package that has also made sure that the demand is dropping disproportionately. But, okay, demand drops a little. You might have less people in the EU eating meat. But because farmers in the EU who are one of the most productive in terms of turning inputs into a kilogram of output, who is going to replace them? You can have the situation where you have less meat eating in the EU, but you have more emissions and a lot more nitrogen and a lot more water use even though you have reduced the, the meat eating in the EU because you have leaked that productivity of a farmer in the EU is now being taken up by a farmer in Brazil who is much dirtier than in comparison to the EU. And technology will make them pick up, but in the short term, you can have less consumption of a dirty product but have more damages produced from it. That's the example of second best economic policy. So this is where we get back to food systems. What are the advantages of the food system? That's where we get back to the disadvantage of policy makers making policies in silos. Agricultural policy here, trade policy over there, is because 
if you're going to implement something that's a second back, best tax, you have to make a policy suite that closes down all the loopholes. Once you put something here, the system's going to move and get around it. Then you have to put something there. Then you have to put something over there. You need tariffs. You need the tax. You need tariffs. You need subsidies to get the effect that you want. And they might not deal directly with the food system. They might deal with some other component in some other um, section of the government. Anyway, I'm out of time. Thank you very much. This, that should be enough to kick off some discussion. How will you spend $5 trillion? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lord. Is any question in the room? Yes, right here, Mike. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your uh, very enlightening presentation. I'm Matthew Rode from Kosen, a Dutch cooperative in food ingredients. Uh, I'm happy to be here because at this moment farmers are blocking our roads because uh, they have to stop their business. Making it a business case, and we all know the numbers, and if we don't know, we, we can grasp the numbers, and it is very compelling and also very easy. Come on. We. But there is a large emotional part to it. So how would you, what would be your recommendation for our government that the last 50 years have been financing and, and promoting our farmers to increase for productivity, to, to be more efficient? And now all of a sudden they say, and now you have to stop. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated question. Like I just say, should EU farming stop? Should EU farming stop? Okay, you make the EU cleaner, but you're making somewhere in the world dirt dirtier. Unless you can equilibrate, you've got leakage. So the first question is, should the EU farming stop if it's so productive? Um, and the second question is, you know, what are they emotionally attached to? Um, are they emotionally attached to the style of production, to the land, to farming? Uh, how easily do they transition to, to the loans between... they got from the bank? Sorry. To the loans they got from the bank, yeah. which they cannot pay back. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Buy them out. Buy them out. How, how did the British government stop slavery? It bought out the slavers. And then by the time, um, you know, new people were looking to get into the game, basically they lost all the capital. They lost all the infrastructure. The people that were running the whole thing were gone. By the time, ten years, ten years later, somebody went, oh, you know, maybe we should start up slavery again. It, the, the economy had already moved on. So, I mean, I have, no, I have no answer to this. But, you know, the other emotional thing is, you, you know, just understanding that we're, we're not in, you know, we're not in a choice where we don't, we're not in a place where we don't have to survive. We have economic peril on this side. We have economic peril on that side. So we're not in a place where we can just, not decide and so you know having them emotionally understand the situation um, you know on this side of what will happen if we do nothing um, that's you know potentially there's a lot of education and advertising you can do with large amounts of money thank you Stephen, I want to say I enjoyed that, but actually it scared me. <laughs> um, and, I, and I suppose I've got a comment or a question that's around kind of global equity. What we've got here are all the ILSI entities from 17 different regions of the planet. And I wondered if you had a comment about the parity of the changes. And you said there's going to be winners and losers. And I suppose one of my deep-seated, uncomfortable feelings is that Hania in Costa Rica might lose much more than Stefan in Washington, D.C., and, and that sort of disparity across the world and how that will play out. Yeah, I didn't, um, 
I didn't. It's a, it's a it's a another very large to topic about you know what is a just transition of the food system. So how to make this just? Um, is that potentially larger in the food system? Um, we have struggled for ever with inequity in our society, the appropriate distribution of economic resources. Um, better Minds Than Mine will be looking to discuss this in the, in the Food System Economic Commission report. You know, I know that, I know that um, equity is, is a large consideration in that report. Uh, how, you know, how, would the EU be willing to make cap payments to a country overseas? Um, is it willing to, you know, make economic change directly um, under development? And it, it, it's a huge question because how much money and how much effort has gone into changing the productivity of agriculture in some parts of Africa? And it would be fantastic. You know, there is the opportunity to, for, for five times, an increase of five times productivity. A cow in Ethiopia, in the highlands of Ethiopia, on average, produces five times less for the same inputs than a cow in, um, in the US or in the EU. So there is a real trade-off there between environmental rationalisation, what is the optimal path to the minimum amount of emissions and everything else, and um, livelihoods, sovereignty. You know, we will determine where our food system is grown and what we are eating. Thank you very much. Um, so, no answer to that one. It's you know, it, it, it's a trade-off, and it, but it, it, at least it is in the picture with with the organisations that are putting out these numbers trying to raise awareness about the economic opportunity in transforming the food system. All I can say is they are keenly aware of the uh, inequity issue. Um, I have worked for the last few years, or a couple of years ago now, with the food system impact valuation initiative that we started. Um, that started because um, corporations, the very large ones, wanted to do their integrated reporting. They wanted to do their end of financial year thing where they talked about their revenues and everything from the measured economic side and then all of their damages they were occurring on the other side. Um, and I know that they're starting to talk about a lot more about the living wages. It's not the perfect solution, of course, but they're starting to talk more at a very high level about representation of inequity in their financial reporting. Um, whether you believe financial reporting or not, every company says that they're net positive for society, that every integrated report that has ever been done says they're net positive. If every company in the world is net positive, why, why are we having such problems? So, um, but it's um, being considered.